Okay, welcome everyone. Um, this is the fourth in our series on pain and dementia and approaches that work. This fourth uh, session and our last one um, focuses on the connection between health disparities and cultural competence and pain and dementia, which we thought was a, an extremely important um, component of our look at this important topic. And uh, I just wanna, before we start, um, let you know that all of the uh, previous three sessions are now available. We've re we recorded the sessions as we're recording today's. They're all available on our website as recordings, and we will be adding this one after the session. In addition to that, um, we are doing uh, issues of our advancing care newsletter, uh, one issue for each of the topics that are being uh, discussed over through this webinar series and that will be available in the next uh, month or two. And we'll let you know uh, when that happens because that also means that you have uh, our newsletter for those of you who may not know is only uh, two pages, <laughs> but it's uh, easily reproducible and shareable. And uh, so that will be available as well soon. Okay, let's get started. Uh, we are going to start with Paula Rice who will do the first presentation today. She is the manager of African American Outreach at Caring Kind, and I'm going to turn this over now to Paula. Thank you, Anne. Uh, good after good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, the topic of uh, my presentation is pain, cultural competence and health disparities from an African-American perspective. Next slide. All right, according to the International Association of Hospice and Palliative Care, pain is what the person says hurts. Uh, they define uh, pain as an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with actual or potential damage to the body. Next slide. But why do people with dementia receive poor pain relief? Uh, people with dementia in the latter stages of Alzheimer's dementia have difficulty articulating their pain. So they can't, it's subjective. They can't say what hurts. Um, and oftentimes within the African-American community, the cause is compounded or complicated um, by other health disparities. Next slide. Now pain in people with dementia uh, presents as behavior. So a person in pain may show behavior of sleeplessness, uh, withdrawal and apathy, increased agitation, anger, combativeness, uh, decreased appetite, or they may moan and cry out. And depending on the patient provider relationship, that pain may not be adequately addressed. Next slide. Health disparities in the African community. Um, health disparities in the African American and African American dementia patients um, can be cultural, uh, belief focused or they are actually cultural, belief focused, socioeconomic, racial, and institutional. Next slide. Um, so cultural health disparities within the African-American community. So African-Americans are two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than whites due to a disproportionate rate of risk factors, uh, which includes obesity, heart disease, hypertension, and uh, diabetes. And depending upon how these um, diseases are addressed uh, can, affect, um, the, um, can affect the person's um, de uh, dementia. Next slide. Okay, so belief-focused health disparities. Um, there can be a lack of trust in the healthcare system. 
And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the Tuskegee experiment. And this is, experiment has been handed down through it within the African-American community where black men were treated with syphilis, were given syphilis and just allowed to deteriorate over 25 years. So, you know, that's the biggest one. So because of that um, experiment, a lot of African-Americans are distrustful of the healthcare system. Uh, a lot of African-Americans believe that memory loss is a normal part of the aging process. And because of that, they get late diagnoses. Um, there's stigma and shame associated with dementia. Um, you know, it's thought of as being crazy or um, I, a lot of older uh, African-Americans will say, I mean, they can be a double amputee and they'll say, well, you know, I don't have my legs, but at least I have my memory. So memory uh, is very important within that community and stigma and shame plays a big role as a health disparity. Um, African-Americans um, are apprehensive about using medication um, and they may seek alternative treatments from herbs and home remedies. Um, I had a um, support group member years ago who told me that she was going to cure her mother of dementia with a uh, home remedy. And I had to refer her to our understanding dementia workshops and some of our other workshops to help her understand the pathology of dementia um, and that um, she, you know, what was lost was lost and that she, more than likely, I mean, she may help boost her mom's memory, but she wasn't able to regain what had already been lost. So, but she was determined. She was determined that uh, she had found a, an herbal remedy and that it was going to cure her mom's dementia. Uh, and then there's religious beliefs within the African-American community um, that serve as health disparities. Um, there's a very strong belief in the power of prayer uh, so that a lot of African-Americans and older ones um, may believe that prayer can, um, they can pray away the person's pain. And they also believe that you don't speak illness into existence. So it's like words have power. They believe that words have power. And the more um, you speak about it, the more power you give the, um, the illness. So it's like, just don't talk about it. If you don't talk about it, it'll go away. Uh, next slide. Um, so now we're looking at socioeconomic health disparities within the African American community. Uh, there's income inequality. Uh, there's inadequate access to health care. Um, limited access to private health insurance. Uh, a lot of people within the African-American community only seek medical, atten medical attention for emergencies. They don't have a primary care physician. Uh, they only go to the hospital um, emergency room when there's a problem. Uh, and then the Medicaid bureaucracy is problematic. And people who do have insurance um, generally have, through their jobs, generally have um, HMOs, and sometimes the co-pays and prescriptions are problematic for them as well. Next slide. And then there's racial and institutional um, health disparities within the African-American community. And I think um, the COVID pandemic really brought a lot of these um, disparities to light because um, a lot of people in the African-American community and brown communities were disproportionately affected by the COVID. And, you know, it was thought that, well, they don't have access to good health care. Well, the reason was, is that public hospitals tend to be located in ethnic communities. Uh, all the private uh, hospitals are in um, majority white communities and these public hospitals are underfunded understaffed and they have a high turnover of physicians. And those were the hospitals that were barraged with um, African-Americans who were suffering from COVID and um, they didn't have the equipment or the staff to handle the amount of um, 
the amount of people that were coming into their um, their emergency rooms. So this is an institutional situation, and this happens with uh, when people you know are suffering with dementia, uh, and because as I mentioned earlier, uh, African Americans tend to get a late diagnosis. Um, they're coming into hospitals and um, nursing homes with late stage dementia and pain and exhibiting the uh, behaviors that we mentioned earlier. Um, and um, they're not being adequately attended. Uh, nursing homes, as like I said, as the COVID pointed out that nursing homes and ethnic communities are understaffed and underfunded as well. Uh, the provider care, and because of that, provider care is oftentimes inadequate. Um, they don't receive a proper diagnosis. Uh, they're oftentimes because um, the patients are seen in the later stages of the disease where they're showing um, disruptive or agitation and they haven't gotten a proper diagnosis. They are oftentimes prescribed psychotropic drugs uh, which is not appropriate for pain management for a person who is suffering from dementia. Um, and then also there was a study done by the University of Virginia, and it was done a while ago. It was done to, in 2015, but what they discovered, they interviewed um, several, they interviewed interns, medical interns, and what they found was that a lot of times medical professionals have some very uh, racial stereotypes that have, you know, that have, that have gone on throughout their families for a long time, uh, and they just hold these stereotypes towards African Americans, and it affects their work and the way they address the management um, of their pain management of their patients. Next slide. All right, so. Um, the way that these health disparities uh, can be addressed is through cultural competence. And cultural competence in a program or among individuals, which enables them to work effectively cross-culturally. Further, it refers to the ability to honor and respect the beliefs, language, interpersonal styles, and the behaviors of individuals and families receiving services. Next slide. <laughs> All right, so cultural competence, you know, in order for cultural competence to be effective, um, there has to be a two-prong approach. So it has to be effective on a system level and it also has to be effective on an individual level. So at a system organization or program level, cultural competence requires a comprehensive plan. It has to be part of the organization's policy. There has to be an infrastructure um, professional development, in-service training, and also, you know, you have to hire people that look like the population that you're serving. Uh, there has to be program administration and evaluation, and uh, there has to be uh, an appropriate delivery of services uh, that enable supports like cons consultants and translation. Next slide. All right, so in order for cultural competence to be effective on an individual level, the health practitioner must be aware of his or her, her own cultural and family values. Um, as I mentioned about the, you know, the University of Virginia study, um, people have to be aware, and I, the people that conducted the study were shocked that physicians and interns um, held these um, held these long-held um, stereotypes of African Americans. And so, you know, and so this has to be, it's better now. So, you know, people, healthcare practitioners have to be aware of their own cultural and family values. They also have to be aware of his or her personal biases and assumptions about people with different values than theirs. Uh, 
uh, and they have to be aware and accept cultural differences between themselves and individual patients. They have to understand the dynamics of that difference and they have to adapt to and respect diversity. All right, next, next slide. I think that's, that might be it. So in, um, in summary, because of the intersection of health disparities within the African-American community, whether it be the cultural disparities, belief-focused disparities, socioeconomic or racial disparities, the healthcare professional has to be aware of these unique barriers. Uh, in other words, they have to be culturally competent and they have to understand and respect and embrace uh, cultural nuances. And not only do they have to be culturally competent as individuals, but the organizations in which they work have to be culturally competent as well. It has to be a part of that organization's policy. Um, things are changing significantly. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, the COVID pandemic really brought out um, the health disparities uh, within the communities, in the African-American community, um, in nursing homes and in hospitals where there were a lot of disproportionate deaths. Um, and so I think moving forward, um, and I think moving forward, pain management for African-Americans will improve. And also, um, here in Kine, I think where our outreach efforts, we play a big role in educating the community so that they can overcome some of the belief-focused barriers um, like recognizing early warning signs and addressing these sooner than later so that um, they can be um, properly managed and receive um, medication in earlier stages of the disease. And we, we, tried, we tried very hard to overcome a lot of those belief-focused disparities so that when it does come um, for, when it does come down to pain management, and the behaviors that are affiliated with, that are associated with pain management, that management that they're addressed appropriately. I have, I mean, there are several clients of mine whose parents have been in nursing homes uh, for years and they have never, and I was just astounded by this, they had never been um, properly diagnosed with dementia. And so their pain, their behaviors of agitation and the sleeplessness are being treated, um, just the individual behaviors are being treated without an overall perceptive perception of the fact that this person has dementia. And I, I'm just, you know, I was just appalled and amazed at that. So I think things are changing. Um, and I think uh, as people become more culturally competent, and the community through the efforts of caring kind or being educated, um, I think we'll be able to do our job. We'll do a better job of um, bringing together a, a good relationship between the provider and the patient and patient care. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paula. You've certainly uh, uh, pointed to the intersection between dementia competence and uh, uh, cultural competence for sure. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Nikki Mariano, who is the Bronx Outreach Manager at Caring Kind. And I'll turn this over to her now. Can everyone hear me? You can hear me? Okay. One. Yeah. Okay. So once again, welcome everyone. I am um, going to be talking about health disparities and cultural competence in the Hispanic community. Let's get started.
we're back. So I thought it was important to define uh, what is a Latino or Hispanic person. So the United States Census Bureau uses the term Hispanic or Latino to refer to a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South or Central American, or other Spanish culture or, or origin, regardless of race, and states that Hispanics or Latinos can be of any race, any ancestry, and any ethnicity. Hispanic people are the largest minority group in the United States. There is an estimated 60.6 .6 million Hispanics in the United States as of July 1st, making up 18% of the total national population. In 2015, the Census Bureau projected that in 2060, Hispanic people will compromise 28.6% of the total population with 119 million Hispanic residing in the United States. Mexican Americans are the largest Latino group in the US. They make up about 63% of Hispanics in the nation. They mostly reside in California. Next in line to Mexicans are Puerto Ricans, then followed by Cubans. Eight states have Hispanic populations of at least 1 million people. That includes New York. So um, as you know, the term Latino or Hispanic is often used interchangeably. I am going to use Hispanic and you'll see why. A 2015 survey found that 50% of Hispanics most often describe themselves by their family's country of origin. So that is if you ask a Latino, where are you from? Or how do you describe yourself? They're gonna say, um, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Mexican. Only 23% use the terms Latino or Hispanic, and 23% often describe themselves as American. As for a preference between the term Hispanic or Latino, the survey found that 32% of Hispanics prefer, Hisp prefer the term Hispanic. Only 15% prefer the term Latino, and the rest have no preference. Um, I, I don't know if um, this is not such a familiar term yet, but um, it's being used now more often. Latinx is a gender, gender neutral word used to refer to a person of Latin American origin or descent. So I love this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So um, it's important to note that Hispanic health is often shaped by factors such as language and cultural barriers, immigration challenges, underrepresentation of Hispanic professionals, also a lack of prevention care and preventative care and a lack of um, healthcare, of insurance. So um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has cited some of the leading cause of illness and death among Hispanics, which include heart disease, cancer, unintentional injuries, stroke, diabetes, and obesity. 50% um, of Hispanics will develop diabetes in their lifetime, and they are 50% more likely to die from the disease than whites. It's also very important to note that Hispanics that live in the US have worse health than Hispanics that live in other countries. And the longer a Hispanic person is in the US, the less healthy they are. Um, there's also uh, disparities among Hispanic subgroups, like Puerto Ricans, for example, suffer more from asthma, HIV AIDS, and infant mortality, whereas Mexican Americans suffer um, disproportionately from diabetes. And um, there's really not a lot of research um, regarding different subgroups. There was just a recent study in 2015 that kind of looked at um, Hispanics um, in respect to their country of origins and their health but there's not a lot of information out there. It is significant to note that Hispanics have the highest rate of any racial or ethnic group within the United States of having no insurance. And they're the most likely to underutilize available healthcare services. The lack of insurance in Hispanic community is tied in part to a lack of health insurance in the workplace, where the rate of uninsured Hispanic is a disturbing 37.9%. And Hispanics are the most likely group to be employed. So they're the most employed out of all groups. And over one third of working adult Hispanics are uninsured compared to about a quarter of working adult Blacks 
and an eighth of working adult whites. So this is interesting. I learned about this several years ago. Um, I went to a meeting for the nurses, Hispanic Nurses Association here in New York. And there was a doctor, a Mexican-American doctor, and he was given a presentation on um, health disparities uh, amongst Latinos. And he shared with us the Hispanic paradox. And we were just like blown away by all of the information he shared. And Despite us having social disadvantages, including lower incomes, worse access to health coverage, Hispanics live longer and have lower death rates from heart disease, cancer, and many other leading causes of death than non-Hispanic whites. So there are many theories as to why this is, including social, uh, strong social networks, healthier eating habits, and lower smoking rates. And this is uh, more true for newer arrivals. So Hispanics that are newer to this country. And these are, these are the stats according to the Census Bureau projection that 2015 life expectancy at birth for a Hispanic is 81.9 years. And for a non-Hispanic whites, it's 79.8 years. On the flip side, uh, this increased longevity includes an increased risk for Alzheimer's. So Latinos are 1.5 times more likely than non-Latino whites to develop Alzheimer's disease. And according to the Administration on Aging between 2008 and 2030, the Latino population aged 65 years and older will increase by 224%. And that's a lot. <laughs> and that's in comparison to a 65% increase for non-Latino white populations in the same category. Um, and as the Latino population ages, Latino communities and families and systems of care will be confronted by increased rates of Alzheimer's with really the fewest resources to manage it. And the important thing is to the access to health coverage must be addressed and corrected along with the availability of culturally competent care. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what is cultural competence and Paula touched a little bit about this. She discussed a bit about this. So cultural and linguistic competence is a set of congregate behaviors, attitudes and policies that come together in a system, agency, or among professionals that enable effective work in cross-cultural situations. And really, I think that any interaction between a healthcare professional and another person is a cross-cultural experience. Um, so some components of, um, of cultural competence includes being aware of one's own worldview, developing positive attitudes toward cultural differences, gaining knowledge of different cultural practices and worldviews, and developing skills for communication and interaction across cultures. I just, I thought it was important because we're talking about cultural competence to define culture and competence. Um, culture refers to integrated patterns of human behavior that include the language, thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions of racial, ethnic, religious, and social groups. Competence implies having the capacity to function effectively as an individual and an organization within the contents of the cultural beliefs, behaviors, and needs presented by consumers and their communities. One second. So one example that I found of cultural incapacity was described in a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. The study found that Hispanics who were treated for certain bone fractures at the UCLA Emergency Medicine, Medicine Center were twice as likely as non-Hispanic white patients to be denied adequ adequate pain medication in the emergency room. The study went on to find that ethnicity, not language, gender, or insurance status was the main predictor for an adequate pain relief. So once again, the study went on to find that ethnicity, so not language, not gender, not insurance status, was really the main predictor for inadequate pain relief. So that's really important because, you know, unfortunately, even when Hispanics have medical insurance and they do seek medical services, they often um, are presented with a system that's not responsive to their needs.
So little is known about Hispanic's pain experience and the potential disparities that exist in pain treatment. Although Hispanics in general report less pain, they report less chronic pain, a 2016 study in the Journal of Pain found that Hispanics report more pain severity and sensitivity in clinical and experimental pain studies than non-Hispanic white participants. We, they, the study also showed that Hispanics are more reluctant to take strong pain medication because they're for fear that, you know, they might become addicted to it. Um, and many believe that pain should be overcome with natural or non-prescription medication. Also this word, which is really hard for me to pronounce, stoicism, I don't know if I said it right, um, and religious manifestations are also common coping strategies for pain. So oftentimes Latinos will, um, when they're in pain or when they're um, dealing with an illness, they'll oftentimes go to their pastor, they'll go to their priest, and they'll ask their community, their religious community for prayers. So praying um, over pain and praying that you could, that you'll get over pain is very common in the Latino community. Um, also to um, maybe being in pain and not wanting to, um, to show it, to physically show that you're in pain, trying to keep the pain in and not really sh um, show any expression of pain is also common. And I do want to say um, very often um, Hispanics um, work, um, their work has to do with pain um, in the sense that oftentimes Latinos are working um, in jobs which are very physically demanding. So for that reason, there is concern about, um, you know, untreated pain really um, having to do with an increase in disability in the long term. So as Latinos age, then there is really a concern that they're going to be in more pain and it's going to lead to disability if, if left untreated. Um, also the importance of cultural competency and healthcare settings seem to be key in making progress in this particular area. Okay, so um, I, I just wanna say that we're really gonna be scratching the surface here um, but let's just jump right in and discuss some common cultural characteristics for Hispanics in the United States, which include familia, respeto, personalismo, y confianza. I think understanding these beliefs and attitudes will help create culturally competent care. Um, but I want to talk about language first, because I think language, as you all can imagine, is one of the biggest barriers um, and Latinos um, getting access to care and, and um, communicating with their providers and other healthcare professionals. So language, um, the provider client patient relationship is built through communication and the effective use of language. And because nearly a third of Hispanics in the US are not fluent in English, many efforts to engage them begin with translation. But focusing on language alone can fall short, especially if the translation does not consider cultural differences. Culturally relevant translation must be relevant to the specific Hispanic subgroup targeted. Okay, so what's um, some a marketing campaign targeting um, Mexicans is going to look very different, should look different than a marketing campaign targeting Dominicans. Um, cultural awareness of accents, idioms, and slang usage is necessary to avoid confusion and miscommunication. Another important consideration is nonverbal cues. Overall, Hispanics tend to be highly attuned to others' nonverbal messages. Non-Spanish speaking healthcare professionals should be particularly sensitive to this tendency when establishing a relationship with clients who only speak Spanish or who are nonverbal. Um, some ways to, to bridge the language barrier include um, bilingual and bicultural professional staff, interpreters, professional interpreters, language skills training for existing staff, phone-based interpreter services, and written translators, just written material. Um, something that's also uh, very important when it comes to language, just a few words spoken in, in Spanish by a healthcare professional can make a difference. So just even learning to just say buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches, that shows that um, as a healthcare professional, you respect the Spanish language and you're respecting their culture. 
So I think we can talk about Spanish, uh, Hispanic culture without talking about familia, family. Um, Hispanic, Hispanic families traditionally emphasize interdependence over independence and are far more likely to be involved in treatment, in the treatment and decision-making process for a patient or a client. Um, so growing up, I, I, you know, I went with my mother to all her doctor appointments. Uh, and not only that, she would ask her comadre, which is my godmother, to go with her to her doctor appointments. Latinos tend to go to their doctor appointments with other family members. So this is a very common and for, for common. And oftentimes when um, a healthcare provider is communicating um, information to the patient or to the client, oftentimes a family member will step in and, and kind of join and be part of the conversation and might answer the questions um, instead of the patient or the client. That's very common. Uh, and family involvement is critical. So it's, it's for this reason, it's very critical in the care of Hispanic patients. Uh, another important aspect of our culture uh, is respeto, respect. Respeto dictates uh, appropriate deferential behavior towards others based on age, sex, social position, economic status, and authority. And I want to say, I always, when I go out into the community, um, I always, I, I, I really love Hispanics. This is one thing I love about my culture. I think we just place um, a high value on, on education, on um, healthcare professionals. We really do. We, um, we respect them uh, because of their education, because of their ability to heal, because of their training. Um, so Hispanics will, um, will respect what a healthcare professional has to say, okay? Um, but what's very important is that when you're a healthcare professional and you're working with an older patient or client, they still expect that respect. And it's still very important that you use formal language when you're addressing older patients. So instead of um, saying tu, which is an informal way of saying you, we use usted. Instead of saying, um, it, it's, it's important to say senora Mariano, senorita Mariano. Um, it's just important to use that language when you're addressing um, older patients for clients. Personalismo means personal rather than institutional um, relationships are important. That's really what personalismo means. It's just, um, it's, it's more about treating others in a more personable way. Hispanics expect health providers to be warm, friendly, and personal, and to take an active interest in patients' lives. So, um, here in the United States, it's often, um, it's common to see maybe um, non-Hispanic healthcare providers kind of standing at a distance um, and, you know, not, not um, being as close to uh, a Hispanic patient or client. And for some people in the Latino community, that can be seen as, you know, the provider is detached or doesn't really, um, doesn't really take a personal interest in them. So, you know, for this reason, it's really important to, to be aware of this, that Hispanic, Hispanic patients' desire for closeness um, to their health healthcare providers more than the, than the content of their verbal exchanges. It also has to do with physical space. So physical space is very important. When interacting with other Hispanics, um, when interacting with other Hispanics typically prefer being closer. And um, a way to do this is maybe just leaning in, sitting a little bit closer, even just a pat on the shoulder, um, those kinds of, of things show warmth and show friendliness um, and also put Hispanic clients at ease. Over time, confianza means trust. Over time by respecting the patient or the client's culture and showing personal interest a healthcare provider can expect to win their confianza, their trust. Um, the healthcare professional who can establish a bond of trust or confianza with his or her Hispanic patient or client will find a profound improvement in the quality of care given 
and willingness of the patient to take wellness and risk reduction advice to heart. So confianza equals compliance. So mind, body, and soul. Mind, body, y espíritu, spirit or soul. Hispanic culture tends to view health from a more synergistic point of view. This view is expressed as a continuum of body, mind, and espíritu. In addition, there's an extensive practice of traditional medicine carried out by curanderos, espiritistas, or healers within the Hispanic community. Um, combining respect for the benefits of mainstream medicine, tradition, and traditional healing, along with a strong religious component from their daily lives. I think over 75% um, of Hispanics are Catholic, um, so religion is a huge part. Hispanic patients uh, may bring quite a broad definition of health to the healthcare setting. Respecting and understanding this view can, can prove beneficial, both in treating and communicating with the Hispanic community, as well as useful for the culturally competent healthcare professional. Um, it's also, I think, important too, um, because a lot of um, Latinos um, use like herbal medicine in conjunction with traditional medicine uh, for providers to um, get comfortable asking questions about what Hispanic clients or patients are using because some of these things can interact um, with the medications that they're on. Health professionals must continue to adjust to a more multi-ethnic, multi-racial society in order to meet the needs of their clients, increasing awareness in health professionals about how culture influences health beliefs and decision-making in Hispanics is critical to reducing dispar disparities along with the availability of culturally competent care. It's also important to know that, you know, there will always be individual variation from any cultural norm. And immigration plays a huge part of this with Hispanics, okay? And also not one size fits all. So just saying the same thing really there. Um, also cultural competency is a life learning process rather than an end in and of itself. So um, it's not like you just achieve cultural competency and then that's it, you know, it's just something you have to continue organizations, individuals have to continue working on because one thing we know about culture is that it changes. It's not stagnant, it evolves. Um, so it's, it's very important for organizations and for individuals um, to learn the culture of the clients that they're, provide, that they're working with, of the communities that they're providing support to and services to. So I love this quote by Helen Keller. It says, I believe that the welfare of each is bound up in the welfare of all. And how true is that, right? <laughs> and that's it, that's my last slide. Thank you so much, Nikki. That was really lovely. Um, you've, you've certainly both been uh, made it very clear that uh, minority status uh, tends to compound problems of identifying and treating pain in people with dementia. And, uh, and, and so I, and I think you've given us lots of insights into all the ways that that can happen. Um, let's take some questions um, from the uh, audience. The first question that uh, came forth was, is there a belief in either one of the cultures that you've talked about today, or the collections of cultures, I should say, um, that, uh, it, that dementia is really a white person's disease? Either one of you or both of you can speak to that. <laughs> I, I certainly have never heard that um, in working with Latinos. I haven't heard that it's a white person's disease. All I've heard is that it's normal, that dementia is a part of aging. And as we age, we just become forgetful. And um, it's something, and for that reason, a lot of times Latinos don't seek help. Um, I, I shared in the presentation, Latinos are the most, uh, are likely to, underutilized health services as it is. So um, when they think a disease or an illness is normal, like it's, it's really hard for them to reach help and let, to get help unless they're educated about it. But I've never heard of it being um, described as a white person's disease. Okay, so within the African-American community, um, it was always referred to as senility. 
And so when a person would start losing their memory, they would say, oh, well, she's senile. And they never associated it with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And I used to hear a lot that the term Alzheimer's, because, of the, because it was named after Dr. Alzheimer's, that they did think it was a, a European disease because of the name Alzheimer's. Um, but I see that that over the years, that has changed. I think it has to do with a lot of our um, outreach efforts and the work of the of Caring Kind and the Alzheimer's Association that now people know that senility is dementia. And I don't hear that as much as I used to do, like maybe about 10 years ago, when people did associate it with um, as a white disease. Uh, I think now they have a better understanding of it. So I think we need to give kudos to ourselves for helping to educate the community. Thank you both. Um, another question that's come along is, um, and not surprisingly, um, is that very interesting statistic uh, that you mentioned, Mickey, about um, that uh, Latin folks are sicker in the US than outside the US, but they have a longer life expectancy here. That's a really interesting, could you maybe talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, so the research just shows that the longer um, a Hispanic has uh, living here in the United States, the, the sicker they are, the unhealthier they are. Um, Latinos that just arrived uh, to the U.S. are healthier on average, and I think a lot of it has to do with probably diet, you know, access to, to the same foods that they would eat um, back in their, in their country of origin. Um, but that's just the truth that stats support that. Um, and, you know, there, we don't know 100% of why. I, also, too, I think also um, family network also, that changes. Um, so a lot when Hispanics come here, you know, they have to leave their families behind. Um, so maybe, you know, grandma was cooking healthy, nutritious meals, and then now they're here in the United States with um without their families and they're having to you know having to do certain things on their own and prepare meals on their own and use the ingredients that are available to them which are not the same ingredients that were um available back home so there are really many reasons as to why that can be um but it is certainly interesting when i learned about it i was just um my mind was blown because it was uh, very uh, different from everything that i have ever heard before and it is an interesting um, also observation that we are talking about, um, as you say, it may be partly that so many folks come at, at different ages too. I mean, not everybody is, I mean, uh, that the, the Hispanics come later in life, mid, mid, mid years, early years. And um, if they were healthier before, that may make a difference too when they first come in terms of how things, yeah, and, and his, Latinos in the United States are um, one of the youngest um, ethnic groups. So they actually come at a young age. Mm -hmm. And that can be, well, we don't know the answer, do we? <laughs> but, we but I think, you know, what I liked about the statistic, I mean, apart from just, it was that it's, it's great to be, to have to think a little differently than we assumed. And I yeah. think health disparity and cultural competence get very, get very caught up in something we know, just as you were saying, and I think this is absolutely true for the uh, African-American community as it is for the Latin or Hispanic community. And that is that it's not as if you're Hispanic or if you're Latin or African-American, this is what we know about you. The fact is we don't know. <laughs> It's not the same as a new person. And um, that it's really critical that we always take one person at a time. The issue is, as you both have made very clear, it's about the assumptions we bring as health providers um, can sometimes uh, really get in our way of responding to the real needs of someone. Um, another question that was raised is, can you uh, each talk about what the word caregiver means? In different character and different cultures, or your in your experience. Well, in the African American, can can you hear me? 
Yes. Uh, in the African American community, uh, people believe in keeping their loved ones at home. Um, so caregiver means really means a family member taking care of an individual that's suffering with dementia and not placing them in a nursing home. I mean, I I had a client who really she said she she called me once and she says my mother is dying and her mother was starving to death because she had stopped being able to eat or chew and i said you know your mom needs a you know she probably needs an iv and she probably needs a you know she needs some nutrition and she said i promised her i would never put her in a nursing home i promised my mom i would never put her in an institution i mean that's how um strong of a belief it is to, you know, within the community to keep your loved ones at home as long as as long as you can um, before putting them in a, um, you know, in an institution or a nursing home. So caregiving means caregiver means within the African-American community of someone within the family, a close family member taking care of that individual. Nikki. Yeah, and in the Latino community, um, caregiving is just like a natural occurrence, right? Um, you're supposed to care for your family um, when they're sick, as they age. Uh, so the term caregiver, cuidador, is not, it's not a very, um, most Latino uh, caregivers don't self-identify as a caregiver. They don't, they don't use the term cuidador, which is the translation of caregiver in Spanish. Um, because again, for them, it's a natural occurrence. It's what you're supposed to do. And it's also a way of giving back um, to your mom, to your dad for taking care of you. So for that reason too, um, Hispanic caregivers tend not to seek um, help. Yeah. You know, they think this is just what they're supposed to do. This is their job. They're supposed to, it's their burden and, you know, and, and it's their duty as good daughters, as good um, sons. Are there any other questions that people have? Let's see. Um, and the note here is that this person finds that in all cultures, her mom said the same to me, uh, this whole idea that, um, you know, anything but a nursing home, please promise me that you won't put me in a nursing home. And I think that is a pretty, uh, a pretty constant refrain. Uh, the, the reality is that many minorities haven't always had equal access to nursing homes, even if they did need them or did want them. And there is also that, that factor, but I, but I would agree that, that promise to a family member that I'll never put you in a home or asking a child to please never put me in a home. Um, you can certainly find that in all, it just plays out a little differently, I think, sometimes from one culture to another because access is also an issue, um, even if you need it or you want it. Um, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a really good question. That is the issue of the lack of participation in research trials. As we all know, there is a great, there has been, you know, there is a huge um, effort to find a cure or preventative for Alzheimer's and, uh, or both. <laughs> and um, so the question of uh, drug trials and whether or not uh, there is a uh, uh, minority participation in these trials and what the barriers are, um, and, and also what, what you know about the extent of their participation. Do you have any thoughts about that in terms of, I know you both. Uh, well, within, I think I mentioned in my present, I mean, and I think it's being mentioned a lot now, the Tuskegee experiment um, within the African-American community. So there's still, uh, an enormous amount of work to be done to overcome the, um, you know, the memory of that and the the mistrust with the healthcare system because um, that was, I mean, it really was a horrible experiment um, to inject someone with, um, you know, syphilis and then just watch them uh, deteriorate over 25 years. I mean. Um, that's something that's spoken about a lot within the African American community. And um, we're the younger people, the younger generation uh, are just now beginning to um, 
see the value, you know, tr trying to overcome that. Uh, they're being, and I think the medical um, field is doing a good job of educating people within the African American community, recognizing the wrongs, um, guaranteeing them that nothing like that will ever happen again. And also, uh, I think there are more um, African American professionals, epidemiologists, and uh, people in the field, neurologists who can go out into the community and talk and kind of reassure the community that, um, the, to reassure them of the importance of them being part of a trial because of some of our, our differences. Uh, the fact that African Americans are two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's than whites um, is a pretty good reason why we need to be included in these trials so they can, um, you know, pinpoint these differences and address them because possibly the medications aren't as effective for us because they don't know because we're not a part of the trial and, and they don't know how we're responding to the medication. So I think that's changing. I think it's changing a lot within the African-American community, but there's still uh, within some, you know, pockets of the, of the uh, community, people who are distrust the, you know, the system and will not be a part, you know, under no circumstances would be a part of a clinical trial. But there are a lot of people that are joining now. So that's a, that's a good thing. I think um, in the Latino community, Latinos are very, you know, underrepresented in clinical trials. And I think um, in part it has to do with, the, um, like I go out to the Latino community and, you know, talk about dementia and talk about um, all different kinds of things, supports, caring kind. And a um, few times when I've had to discuss clinical trial, what um, often I see in people's faces is they just don't have any idea of what it is. What's a clinical trial? You know, it's, so it's a, there's a lack of education in the Latino community about clinical trials, about studies. Um, so that's, I think that's where we need to start in, in educating Latinos about clinical trials. And then also about, um, you know, the second question after what is the clinical trial is, well, how does it benefit me? How does it benefit me? So I think that, you know, there, there's a lot of work to be done in the Latino community when it comes to um, educating about uh, clinical trials and recruiting Latinos um, to clinical studies. It's really important, um, but there's just not a lot of uh, education out there about it. Um, it's not a lot of information out there about it. So um, that's that's what I find the most. It's just Latinos don't even know <laughs> what it is. So. Thank you. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that you both have uh, touched on and emphasized really is the fact that uh, the minorities that you're speaking about are, are um, more likely to be diagnosed with dementia. I mean, I'm sorry, they're more likely to have it, you're saying, rather than, I guess that's the distinction maybe you could each just speak to is what's the difference between more likely to have it versus more likely to be diagnosed? or less likely to be diagnosed. Yeah, I think uh, I would probably say Latinos, my guess is Latinos are less likely to be diagnosed. Um, and when diagnosed, they're diagnosed at a much later stage in the disease. Um, because it's it's often until, uh, you know, this is true for, for um, people with dementia in, in, in general and their caregivers, caregivers tend to reach out for help when uh, people with dementia start to have behavioral issues and need more care. So um, I think Latinos wait even um, longer <laughs> to reach out for help, uh, unfortunately. So, Paula? Um, I think I, I, um, part of that is true within the African-American community as well. Uh, people wait um, you know, too long, they wait until the disease has progressed into the, you know, late to middle stage, to late to middle stage of the disease before they reach out for any help uh, because the early symptoms, when they're more subtle, they think of them as, you know, just a normal part of aging. But what I've also noticed is that when, because 
uh, within the African American community, they do wait too long to get a diagnosis. They're not properly diagnosed. Um, they're diagnosed because by the time that happens, a lot of the behaviors might present themselves as uh, bipolar disorder or some type of schizophrenia. And I, I, I mean, it's just amazing how many people uh, I've come in contact with within the African American community that they've been diagnosed with, um, they've been given Seroquel. That's like really, really common. And I've asked, you know, well, did they have a neurological evaluation? No. And a lot of that has to do with access to health care because if they're within an HMO or depending on what type of insurance they have, they may not be able to get a um, diagnosis from a, um, a specialist. So they're just going to their primary care and the primary care sees the person is you know, agitated or combative or whatever, and they'll just prescribe the, um, the psychotro psychotropic drug and they're not getting a thorough um, neurological evaluation. So it has to do with that's, you know, you know, the inability to access good health care, you know? That brings us full circle to where we started with this series, and that is um, basically that if you see behavior in someone with dementia, it often means pain. So mm -hmm. that if, if uh, that diagnosis is not there, they're even less likely uh, to get to get adequate attention, and in fact, more likely to be treated with antipsychotics, which not only don't solve the problem or put them at, and also puts them at greater risk, but it also means that their pain is not treated. So I think this exactly. is a very important um, addition to our, our pain conversation, and I thank you both very much. Um, I want to just end by reminding everybody that all of our sessions are now available, or this one will still shortly be added um, on our website, uh, recordings of the sessions. And um, we thank everyone who has uh, given us uh, attention for this series. And we're very grateful to all the people uh, who presented in this series and shared their, their wisdom, their experience, and their areas of concern. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Anne. And thank you for everybody who joined us today.